<laughs> hey, everybody. Uh, welcome again to another episode on Ahead of the Curve. Today, uh, I've got my good friend. Uh, I'm going to mess this up. I swear to God, I'm going to mess it up again. You got this. Correct? Yes. Did I get that right? Of course. <laughs> I think so. You did great because you practiced. <laughs> And we're going to be covering, uh, well, we're going to try and cover a lot of different media today uh, based around basically digital art, interactive art, uh, all of these different experiences that kind of grew up and then fell down um, due to, uh, I heard a friend of mine say this, Covidia is what he's referencing, <laughs> what he's referencing this time. Is that what we're calling so, it now? I, I don't know. So yeah. Sounds let's just so call elegant. <laughs> Covidia, it is kind of elegant, isn't it? Might be like a little a tech bit. Startup. Like a Pardon? like a tech startup. <laughs> Covidia, the new tech startup. You know what? It might not be a bad name if you can really get something off the ground during this time because people are going to remember it, but that might not be too good for branding because it's mm. probably going to really be ne negatively thought of over time, but I don't know. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about uh, a lot of different issues um, with digital art right now. Well, not, it, not necessarily issues, but maybe some other opportunities um, and kind of get a, a, a different take from an artist, an active artist in the industry um, to kind of just get some feedback and, and just, you know, talk about, talk about where we are today. So synth struct, synth struct. You can call me Ginger. It's all Ginger. good. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Of course. So could you give us a little background on yourself and kind of how you got into the whole, uh, how you got into the whole industry and how you started creating what you're creating now? Sure. Yeah, actually. Um, so I'm an interactive designer. I uh, do live performances using all sorts of sensors. I love working with sensors and data, um, tinkering, doing experimental stuff, finding creative ways to do live control to uh, interact with the visual systems and the audio system. So when I do live performances, I do all of the sound design, all of the visual design, and then um, having created those interactive generative audio and visual systems, and I find creative ways to then interact with it live. Um, so there's the live performance aspect. There's also, um, I do interactive installations. So I work with uh, science centers, like locally the Orlando Science Center. Um, I did a performance at the uh, Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, and so I do work science into the installations that I do because I love science, I love math. Um, and again, a lot of sensors for the interactivity. So finding ways to uh, do what I love doing and then also find a way to share that with other people. So it's not just me exploring what I love, but then finding ways to then let other people also explore that and have control over their experience through the interactive experiences and the other stuff. And I also do workshops and uh, teach uh, creative coding I used to run Processing Orlando. Now I do a lot of touch designer work. Um, so love generative work and and a lot of real time and, and whatnot. So um, awesome. I can show some quick examples of my work for those of you that aren't familiar. And then uh, you guys will know a little bit more about what I'm talking about and uh, some examples. Hello to Thank everyone you. watching. Thanks for joining <laughs> today. Nice to see you here. Um, so this hey, Nora. Up. Nora's great. I love Nora. Uh, and she's also a fellow touch designer worker. So a lot of uh, touch designer people are probably going to be logging on, hopefully. Touch designer is great. Um, so this is a performance that I did at Art Tech House. So showing a little behind the scenes. Um, I'm using the Mumu gloves, and they're uh, sensor enabled gloves. So they have a um, gyroscope and other sensors that can basically detect everything that I'm doing with my hands. So um, how I'm moving them in three dimensional space and different gestures that I'm making that I can map. Um, and with this, I actually, um, there's the gloves themselves that I'm using to control 3D environments to uh, interact with the sound during the live performance and also a uh, interface. And that is my mobile device. So that's a touch OSC interface that I- yeah, I was um, going to ask if that's OSC driven. It is OSC driven, yeah. Yeah, we touched um, on a lot of that last week as well with uh, Lewis. What's that? We touched on a lot of that as well last week with Lewis. Yeah, I love a, OSC. an artist out of uh, the UK that does a lot of really cool, crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, OSC is basically his magic sauce, so. A lot of people um, that are watching, they probably already know, but if you're uh, not sure. So OSC, OSC is really great. It allows you to wirelessly communicate and send messages to uh, different software. So, for example, um, when I set everything up for this performance, 
the audio and visual systems. What that let me do is then send messages to uh, calibrate everything, um, to do different uh, parameters and scene changes and things like that and test everything before the show remotely so that when I'm standing in the audience, I don't have to continually run to my computer or have someone stand at my computer and say, hey, can you just change this parameter really quickly? So this has been um, something that I love doing for a lot of my installations is creating these custom interfaces that let me change parameters what if I'm walking around an audience or at a show or even an installation and that way I can just tweak stuff and uh, remotely be able to control it. So um, so that's a look at the interface that I was using along with the gloves during the performance. Uh, that's a look at what it looked like on my arm. Um, this is a shot from the live performance at Art Tech House. So um, during the performance, there were several different scenes where I'm exploring the mathematics of sound. And so um, I'm actually with the gloves controlling throughout the whole performance. Uh, doing a lot of FM synthesis. So we were talking about this last night. Um, so controlling yeah. basically uh, combinations of, of different filters and um, like four different oscillators throughout the course of the, the um, performance that I'm modulating and doing different things with to visualize the mathematical relationship of the sound. So the different scenes are visualiz visualizations of the sound waves and the relationship of that. Um, here's another shot from that. You can see the audience down in the bottom. And then here's an end scene also visualizing the sound vibrations or sound um, the oscillations. This reality, this was a full dome performance at the Orlando Science Center uh, that I was also using the Mimu gloves for. So you can see that there. Yeah, um, we were talking a little earlier about, you know, your use of colors and your and and um, the difference between the color and the high contrast work that you do. Yeah. And, do you want me to, to touch upon that a little bit? Yeah, just a little bit. Yeah, because I found that pretty fascinating, you know? Sure, so um, a lot of the work that you're gonna see from me is in black and white, and that is definitely by choice. Um, my preference is to have everything in black and white. Um, a lot of times when I do stuff in color, since I'm an experienced designer along with all the digital art that I do, at the core of it, it's an, ex an experience that I'm creating for other people. Um, so there's that balance between doing exactly what I want, but also making it enjoyable for the people that are experiencing it. So for uh, viscerality, I actually chose to do something in color because um, I knew that there was going to be a lot of children, all ages, that were watching this 45 minute full dome performance. And so even though I love the glitched out abstract black and white uh, geometric forms and a lot of pulsing lights and you know a lot of my work comes with a seizure warning because there's just a lot of stuff going on. Um, for this one in particular, I knew that there were going to be a lot of children, very young, that were watching this long performance. So um, I chose to do color for this, but if I was going to do color, then obviously I wanted to do something that's very cyberpunk and, you know, inspired by that colorful end of things and not just, you know, uh, I don't know, pastels or whatever. I guess you could call it pastels, but the inspire inspiration for this was to do something a little bit more cyberpunk with it. So yeah. I don't awesome. have to do more yeah. than I do, then I go, you know, neon bright, bright colors. Um, this was another full dome performance. And again, so you can see the black and white in the background. Um, this was doing the live cymatics. I do a lot of cymatics work, so I'll explain that more towards the end because I have some uh, photographs from that. So um, basically it's taking physical sound, sound vibrations. You can see the speaker on the bottom there. Um, so it's the physical sound vibrations. And um, I was visualizing that on the full dome. Um, this was actually the second live cymatics performance that I did that was full dome. And so basically it's taking the large scale version of those physical sound vibrations in live in real time. So I'm creating the audio in real time and then visualizing uh, the physical vibrations from that on the dome. And that's just to show you the, the scale of the dome. And uh, this was at the Society for Art and Technology in Montreal. That's another shot. My hometown. Yeah, that's right. That is correct, yeah. I love Montreal, it's a great place. First, somehow I end up back there every year for completely different reasons, so. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good, yeah, I, I mean, after a while, you just start making up reasons to go. Yeah, and I, you know, I've been lucky enough to, to be invited back for different reasons. Like I just, um, so this was, I think, two years ago for this, and then last year was the Touch Designer Summit, which I uh, did a workshop at, and I did a actually a VJing event at that they invited me to do, which was really fun. Um, but I was there for the Touch Designer Summit, and Mutech was there the following week, so I yep. stayed there for two weeks for that, so so that was a yep. really great experience. Mutech is awesome. If anybody ever gets the chance to experience it, like, go. It's really cool. Definitely, yeah, it's and they have them. For a long time. Uh, Montreal, San Francisco, uh, Japan, 
a couple different places and um, I've only been unfortunately only to the one in Montreal but I'm really excited to check out the others so I'm really glad that I yeah agreed, yeah, that's, <laughs> that is great. agreed. and during uh during Mutech they also had a show um, on the dome every night so it was really great to be able to do all the Mutech stuff and then you know at the very end of the night that always had their own um, performances that you could check out as well so that was really nice uh, this was in uh, downtown Orlando. So this was an um, interactive light installation that I did that uh, it had a heart rate sensor. And so people could visualize their heartbeat. Um, that, was for, that was for Immerse, right? For Immerse, yeah. yeah. So Immerse yeah. is a, a great big kind of interactive festival that takes place here in Orlando every year. Mm -hmm. Well, at least it did take place here in Orlando every year. It might not this year. Hopefully. I think it will. It's not until October usually. So yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I mean, if we're still in this in October, then that's very maybe it maybe it'll be so we'll see distanced art. Yeah, you know, like keep six feet apart kind of stuff. But that's one of the things that we're going to talk about is like, so if they can't yeah. be open to the public in October, exploring other ways that you can still experience it remotely. So that's definitely something that we are going to talk about. Um, just another quick shot of that. And then the, the setup for that. This was a previous immersing a connect installation that was projected on the wall. Um, this is at Snap Orlando doing an EEG. So getting their um, uh, real time brainwave activity and then translating that to visualizations that they can control. Um, and basically, the more focused that they are, then the more that 3D Rorschach form comes to life and responds to what they're doing. So it's like a feedback loop. Um, so the more focused and the more active it becomes, giving them something to focus on, and then um, has inspiring more focus, et cetera. And so it's kind of feeding back. And there's that shots of people doing the, the EEG. Um, and then I think this is the last one. This is a, a couple of different places. So this was actually a really fun one. Um, so going into the interactivity of it. So with this one, I was inspired by, um, I knew that I had a whole room to work with for setting this up for um, the main place this was at the first time was um, Orlando Science Center and then Snap Gallery um, and then University of Central Florida. And so for this one, um, I really wanted to explore the idea of kind of a, a futuristic setting where people worship sound. And mm -hmm. so as you can kind of see- Sound I know, as a god. Yeah, exactly. And so from the construction of it, they're kind of psychologically all feeding into the structure that um, there's six pedestals and when they touch it, uh, it is conductive. So basically they're completing a loop, which I'll go into how it's set up in a second because it's actually really interesting. Um, so when they touch the pedestal, they're activating um, a harmonic frequency and they all have a different harmonic tone and they can hear each other's tone. So basically they're collaboratively creating these different harmonics um, they all have headphones on and they can hear each other um, creating the sound. And then uh, the lights um, basically light up the uh, panel corresponding to the different um, symbols. So basically the symbol in the front is the uh, fundamental. And then in the second one behind it is showing that for every one cycle that the first one goes through, the second one goes through two cycles and then you know double that, et cetera. So you can see the the symbolic representation of the sound, which you'll notice is a theme with me, is like <laughs> seeing exactly how sound is represented mathematically, um, and also hopefully making that aesthetically interesting to you. Um, so with the uh, completing the circuit, actually, so I had them, when they touched the pedestal, the, ped the pedestal itself, I made, made all of those concrete pedestals, they're like 200 pounds. Um, and so because they were so new, I had a wire running to the bottom of it and they still had some water content in it. They oh, were man. I remember seeing your posts on some of this stuff. Like, yeah, I remember. It was, it was a really interesting, like one of the happy accidents that was so bizarre that I was just so in love with it. So originally I was gonna have them have to touch something that was on the surface of it. But I discovered by accident when I was uh, installing it that when I ran a wire to the bottom of it, um, because they, they were maybe, they cured for, I think like a week. So they were dry to the, the touch, but there was still some water inside of it. Yeah. So when I ran the wire to the bottom of it, then there was enough water content inside of it that it was still conductive. And so what I ended up doing was you can see in that picture there, there's a conductive thread. And so one of the challenges when you're doing experience design is like the, the difference between them consciously having to opt into participating with something versus something just you know being there that they don't have to consciously do this so i didn't want them to have to like okay explain to everybody touch this and then you also have to touch this and you're doing two different things that you have to keep track of so with this uh, the headphones i knew they'd be putting those on so i actually put the conductive thread in the headphone so it would make contact with their ear 
And so that was, super that, was the, part. that was the first part of it. And then whenever they touched the uh, the uh, concrete, then it then it completed the circuit. So basically, it's going the circuit would go through the headphones, through their body, through their body, through their hand, exactly, and back, and, the, the and then they would activate it. So yeah, so I thought that was a really fun, cool accident that uh, that made me really excited that just the pillar itself was conductive on its own without having to uh, add all this extra stuff to it. So. I, I think that's like one of the fun parts too about these happy accidents, because I'm sure at first you probably experienced a little bit of panic and went, oh crap, now what? Mm -hmm. you, you kind of, you know, you brainstorm these ideas and you come up with these kind of different solutions, I guess. And it's like, let's try this, let's try this. Oh, this could be cool, this could be cool. And you kind of develop that and it, it takes kind of a new form, right? A new yeah. unexpected form that might be, you know, well, as you mentioned, a happy accident. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I love when that happens. And the, so the, I guess the really funny thing is that like they had a very short period of time where, where that actually worked because as they, cured more and more and the water started to not be conductive anymore because it, it was just completely cured. Um, water down the pillars, water down the pillars. I did, yes, have to do that. Actually, um, towards the last couple of days of this installation, I had to uh, spray them down and then it would get absorbed into it. So it's not like it was like wet to the touch, it would get absorbed into it and then it would work. But yeah, after you know a week of having this up, then it no longer worked that way. So it was kind of like one of those very time sensitive, I have a short window for it to work this way, but but <laughs> when it did work, it was great. So, and now they're in my front yard as a decorative uh, concrete. As a new decorative piece? Yeah. Um, and then, so Cymatics, uh, I've done a lot of work with this. So this is a permanent installation at the Orlando Science Center. So this is um, a uh, leap motion base, so you can move your hand and it changes. It basically works like a theremin. So you can move your hand up and down and it changes the frequency, left and right adjusts the amplitude. And then, so this is a projection of the um, the physical vibrations of the water, which is inside, actually, I don't think I have a picture of that, but um, inside of the case. And um, I got to design the case itself, of course. So I um, designed it so you could see inside the window um, what's actually happening so that people who go to the science center who are interested in sound vibrations um, they can understand that connection between what's physically happening with the water and the the patterns that they're seeing on the geometry. So it's not just these like abstract geometric patterns that's actually being created from the sound that they're choosing with the um, changing the frequency and exploring sound that way. So so weaving in the the science aspect with the uh, the interactivity and and the visuals and the love for sound and visualizing sound. <laughs> and, then, and then this is, um, I think this is the last one. Yes, and then this is a photograph of sound vi vibration. So I did a yeah, lot of I work. Yeah, I thought that was, I thought it was cool uh, about you, you know, having a huge interest in photography as well. So did yeah. the photography come before or did that just kind of inherently come as part of creating motion graphics and creating generative art? Um, I would say uh, to some extent the <laughs> photography came before. So, um, as we were talking about, I love exploring forms specifically and movement. So with a lot of this, I did um, still photography, but I also did a lot of videography because it's really interesting to see how they move over time. The thing that I loved about the still photography is that there's so many variables. Like if you, um, so that a lot of times with cymatics, people will think that there's like, okay, this frequency equals exactly this. And this is like the only visual behavior for this frequency. But the thing is um, that when I'm doing this, there's different size containers, there's different substances, uh, liquids that I'm using, there's uh, different speakers that I'm using, there's different light sources that I'm using, there's different uh, camera techniques I'm using. So a lot of what I was doing is not just, um, I was, ex I was um, approaching it scientifically, but a lot of what I was doing was experimenting also with the visual side of it. So if I have the exact same settings and I don't change anything except how I'm capturing it with a the camera, then by changing, for example, the exposure, um, you know, taking like a one second uh, shot versus like a 0 0.01 second shot, for example, or 1 60th of a second, um, then that creates a totally different effect. So especially um, the relationship between the frequency and the shutter speed. So for example, if I'm doing 60 Hertz and I capture it at 1 60th of a second, I'm gonna capture that period, that periodic motion at like the same point if I capture it at the same time. So it depends when I push the button, it's gonna have a, whole, a totally different photograph, so. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, so to answer your question, uh, I was doing photography before uh, a lot of this and um, 
I think that's also where I realized that I really don't like working with color because I would see a lot of um, things that I wanted to capture, especially when I'm walking around in the world. And then you see like, let's say there's a yellow fire hydrant and then it totally throws off the shot. And so, um, you know, we were saying like, I love black and white because it allows me to focus on the things that I want to focus on and not have to think about the things that I don't want to think about. Like, here's this one thing that's ruining the shot, you know, and I do want to focus on the contrast and the form and the movement and those things that are really interesting to me and not have to think about my color palette. Well, you could always just paint the fire hydrant red. Or just put it in black and white. <laughs> shoot, <laughs> shoot in black and white would be the optimal thing to do there. I mean, a lot of the photos that I did before this, they tended to be, um, you know, of like nature and things that were like, not like nature scenes, but you know, like if there was like a really weird looking flower that had really cool geometric properties that I liked, then I would photograph that. And then, you know, that was the thing that I liked about it. So I'd be able to focus on the things that I liked and not have these wide swooping scenes that I was, uh, having to Photoshop out different elements. <laughs> so I'm actually gonna like switch, switch us up here a little bit. Yeah. And um, you mentioned earlier about, you know, the spaces and the environments that you create your art in. Mm -hmm. And I think that's like, especially um, important to kind of talk about in today's, in today's situation, because of course things have dynamically changed quite a bit in the, where, in the world that we're living in currently. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk to you a little bit more about, you know, your feelings on the importance of the environment and on, you know, the, the different types of content that you're creating currently or experimenting with now. But just kind of touching on the aspects of, you know, the live or the live vibe when you go and experience something as opposed to, let's say, you know, working in something in a more virtual sense. Yeah, definitely. Um, and this is, of course, especially now, something that I am exploring much more deeply. Um, so for my live performances, one of the things that I really love about it is um, experience design is an art form. And it's not just when I show up to a venue and my work that I'm presenting, but in that moment, when you go to see a live show, there are so many different creative minds that go into crafting that moment. So, you know, when you go to a live venue, the venue itself, there are architects that had to work on the layout of the venue and in crafting it to be the optimal sound and the acoustics and, and the experience that you're going to have in the physical space itself. You know, where is the bar in relationship to the stage? Where are all these things? And so they're crafting the space itself, um, you know, choosing which projectors to use to fill the walls, things like that. Um, there's lighting designers. So, you know, lighting the designers, if they have, um, choices for the lighting that they're using, you know, they have to pick the lights that they use, they have to choose the colors for the lights, all of that creates a certain mood, um, choosing the timing of when they're, they're triggering certain lights. Um, and, you know, for my work, I do mostly projection, but this is speaking more broadly. So, you know, there, there's the lighting engineers and all the contributions they make, there's the performers on stage, uh, feeding off of the audience. And so whenever they're doing a performance and the audience is responding to them, that's a huge contribution because if they're performing for a screen and there's nobody there, then that's going to affect their performance and, you know, how they're feeling when they're putting on that performance. Um, you know, so there's so many aspects. And so whenever you go to see something, there are so many people, so many different creatives involved with crafting that moment. And so um, talking about how that translates to doing something virtual. So for example, if I was to take my live performance, um, we'll take the Arctic House performance as an example. So when I was creating That's that- a good example. Because <laughs> it's the most recent one. Um, I might also give it a full dome example, but so for Arctic House, it's the 270 degrees. It's a, a really great space. They use it for um, installations during the day, immersive installations, and they did the um, live performance series. So when I was creating something for, for that venue, I knew ahead of time what the venue looked like. And I actually created the visuals with that, that venue in mind and with the shape of the venue in mind. And so I knew that I wanted to create the visuals to take advantage of that 270 uh, degree angle and coming towards it and uh, towards the audience. And I knew I was gonna be using the gloves. And so what's kind of, I guess, unique about how I perform is instead of being in front of the audience and have people watch me and watch what's behind me, for me, I like to know what the audience is experiencing. And uh, when I'm using the gloves, I'm actually manipulating and crafting and uh, orchestrating the experience in that moment. 
So I create generative systems um, and there's like a loose, um, loose flow to everything, but I'm actually exploring and manipulating the visuals and manipulating the sound 100% live. And so um, since I like to know exactly what the audience is seeing, because this isn't all like rehearsed or like pre-rendered ahead of time. Yeah, um, you're just like kind of winging it. And... Exactly. So you probably, um, you saw in the photograph from, from our tech house, I was actually standing with the audience looking at the visuals. And so um, that's kind of a different way of presenting a live performance because usually people are used to looking at the performer and then the visuals behind them. But yep. with a lot of my work, um, even in the, the dome performance at the Orlando Science Center, I'm among the audience and I'm seeing exactly what they're seeing. So I can make decisions about what I wanna do because I'm literally experiencing what what they're seeing and hearing what they're hearing you know probably a slightly different uh, placement in the room of course but um <laughs> but that lets me understand okay so this is what i want to do with it because whatever i'm seeing is is actually what they're seeing so um and just speaking of audience i just wanted to say hi to everybody again um on the air with ginger if you guys have any questions or any comments you want to you want to post this is we're trying to keep it pretty interactive as well um a, a kind of like topic and the things we're talking about today so if you guys have anything that you want to bring up, any topics you want us to touch upon, even if it's a little off, please feel free to post your po your, your comments in the uh, the comment side, uh, and we'll definitely address them as we're moving on. So yeah. sorry, I just wanted to. Oh, no, you're good. Yeah, definitely. Please feel free to ask questions. As some of you know, I love to answer questions. So that's the <laughs> whole, whole reason that we're here today. We so. might not get to them all like right now, but we will definitely you know get get to them towards the end of the uh, discussion. Yeah, definitely. Um, so so one of the things that I wanna emphasize is, you know, when you go to these live per performances or pretty much like any time that you go to these experience, it, it is an art form to craft that experience. And there is a lot of thought that goes into it. So, you know, me as a performer, I put every thought into my, my part of it, you know, what I'm bringing to the table, but, you know, the architect and the people that run the venue, I mean, they put a lot of thought into creating the best experience and crafting the best experience and everybody that's involved with putting that show together. And so, uh, can this adapt for music and film festivals? Yeah, I think we're gonna remember that question because I think we're gonna touch on that. <laughs> again. It's on the uh, top. Awesome. Um, yeah, so, so translating those experiences um to something virtual so currently we can't go to these venues like we used to be able to presently hopefully it's short term but at the moment um that's inspired me to find ways of can you translate the same kind of experience to a virtual experience you know yeah. something that you can experience online or you know even something um what i've been looking into with my work since i create these immersive uh environments that usually are projected around you um, what I've been looking into that would make the most sense for my work is doing um, like a 360 experience or a virtual um, VR experience that you can download or even augmented reality. But the thing that I like about uh, VR is it's very close to the full dome experience or the um, immersive 360 experience. And so yeah, there's been a lot of conversations with a lot of people, especially recently about virtual reality. And, you know, it's been one of those technologies that has been around, but mm -hmm. it's kind of been on the sidelines in a lot of ways, like for all of us on a consumer level. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people that have headsets, but they're mainly using them for gaming experiences and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, what about using those tools to create these digital experiences, like creating an inter interactive kind of art museum, if you will, mm -hmm. in a virtual environment, mm -hmm. which I think is an interesting concept. Yeah, and one of the things that, that we were talking about briefly um, before this was um, kind of treating it as a different experience. So there's there's the approach of you know the the fast. How can we take this physical space and then translate it to something that people can still experience at home? And you've seen a lot of people posting. Um, you know, different museums now have you can go through virtually and explore a museum and things like that. And you know, in the short term, it's been wonderful because then people have something to do while that while they're stuck at home. If they want to get out, then they can do that. And I think that that is um, an excellent thing that a lot of these venues have been doing. Of like, you know, go explore this museum. Um, in the long term, though, thinking of the optimal way of presenting it, you know, like if if this didn't have to be done this week, but thinking of the long term, um, a way of getting the same quality of experience that you would get from going to these live venues. Um, I was telling you, you know, I would 
approach it completely different. So when I'm creating something for a venue, I do stuff very site specific. And I 100 yeah. percent, you know, put myself in the mentality of this is going to be in the space and think only of how to optimize the experience in that space. And so if I'm creating an experience for 360, then I would treat that basically as an entirely different venue. So I would think only, you know, not just porting the experience directly over to 360 and like, you know, boom, put in a camera in the center of this environment, you're done, you're done. But I would start thinking more in depth about, you know, like if people are going through the, uh, we'll say effort, if they're going through the effort of, of buying into this experience, you know, so maybe they have to download it or whatever, but if they're, if they're um, going through the effort of saying, okay, I'm going to take time to experience this, because there's so many things that you could do, you know, with your life. And so if you're taking the time to want to experience something, then, you know, I want to make it worth people's while. I don't want to just create um, something that's really pretty to look at, and they can, you know, put on the headset, go through all this effort to go in the VR. And then, you know, two minutes later, they're like, oh, that was cool. And then be done with it. And so yeah. what I want to do is explore more, you know, uh, storytelling and narrative and things like that. Or I always love, of course, interaction. And so I love giving people the ability to control their own experience. And so I don't want to just put them in a world where they're passively just watching something really cool, but something that they would want to spend that much time in because it's something that they can connect with and something that they can have some kind of control over the experience and how it evolves and, and whatnot. So I always like to bring it back in some ways and sometimes like video games, like open mm -hmm. world video games, like World of Minecraft or not, yeah. world, not world of uh, Warcraft. I guess that would be <laughs> one of them, but uh, Minecraft being, you know, so popular, vastly popular just because it's free play ex exploration. You get to go all over the place and do different things. Um, you know, so I find that is um, an interesting kind of concept. And I think that people kind of drive towards wanting to kind of go outside the bounds a little bit and explore in different ways. Um, Sergio, I saw your question about um, interactive uh, sensors and things that you like to use or the ones that you prefer to use, Ginger. Um, I think we might touch on that actually just a little bit later on. Okay. Throughout, throughout the, uh, we have a QA and a session that we typically do uh, toward the tail end of of these um, these sessions, so we'll definitely get to some of those those other questions a little later. But sorry, sorry, um, <laughs> I kind of threw that off completely. But yeah, we were talking about uh, you know the creating uh, or creating or creating these these immersive uh, experiences based off of the environments, essentially, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So. Um, Inside of creating content, because you know, con content and and experience design, I think when you're you're bringing it into a different context and looking into creating these environments in a virtual world or an extended reality, as some people might reference to it, um, you know, it's kind of an open playground, right? Mm -hmm. Like you build your own world, you build your own venue, you build your own space, essentially. Mm -hmm. And sound, not just video, right. but yeah. Sound too, not just yeah, visual, but also sound, whole, yeah, crafting thing, everything. Right? Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about HVACs. You don't have to worry about, you know, what's going on in the next room or if there's wind or in, environmental things, but you get to create all of that. Mm -hmm. So what are your feelings, you know, based on that, on, on that information, what are your feelings about um, having a comparison between a live experience and a virtual experience? Like, mm -hmm. What do you feel are the pros and the cons of them? Well, I think that's a loaded, pretty heavy <laughs> beauty question, but no, we got this. Um, my personal thoughts on it is that live experiences, I think those are always going to be optimal because you have, as I mentioned before, everybody working to craft that moment the best that they can for you to go out and experience. And then you have, of course, the social aspect, which not everybody is social. I mean, granted, a lot of people would love to just stay at home and experience everything from the comfort of their home. And there's a lot of different types of people, but um, I think that experiencing things live is in many ways optimal for those particular experiences. Um, I think it is, of course, um, moving towards doing experiences in VR. My approach has been previously that if I'm gonna do that, it would be as um, in addition to this live experience. So 
if I'm doing something in VR, then it might be just to visualize what it would look like on the dome, you know, and do some kind of like, like previous yeah, and stuff. Yeah, more of a visualization tool. Exactly, yeah. Um, so I think that they have different benefits. And when I start getting into translating those live performances into a VR experience, then as we were talking about last night, I mean, it becomes very close to game design. It's yeah. very, very close to overlapping there. Um, and there's a lot of um, really great festivals, uh, music festivals that if they haven't had time to prepare for this, you know, they've had to find ways to translate to online. And there's been a, a ton of live streams and whatnot and people partnering up. And There uh, are so many companies that are dealing with that right now. You know, a lot of trade shows that are trying to go virtual and scrambling to figure out the best way to get the information across to people at home and keep them engaged. And, you know, there's just so many different aspects of that whole, that whole thing to try and figure out. Exactly. And so, you know, given enough time, I think when people have time to prepare and think about like, this is going to be an online experience, you know, then taking their festivals that are a couple months out and finding ways to present those as an experience that can be accessible um, to people who can't go out into the public. And since they have time to prepare, I think that um, there's some really great options to find ways to make those experiences uh, particularly crafted for the online experience, having enough time to prepare for that and to treat it as like, this is the optimal way of presenting it, given that it is gonna be online. So, you know, in a short period of time, I think that that doing these live streams and everything, I think they, they've been a really great solution, but I think, you know, given a couple months to to plan ahead of time, there's a lot of different ways, like like we were just talking about Mutech, like, you know, um, they're known for a lot of their, their audiovisual innovation and doing these incredible performances. The ones that I saw were in this huge, massive uh, theater, um, not a movie theater, but a performance theater, and it was incredible. So, you know, taking those experiences and having enough time to prepare, you can find really nice ways to translate those experiences to something, um, that isn't compromising the work. That makes sense. So like on a larger scale, we've been seeing um, a lot of these different types of art showcase places, uh, some of which kind of cater a more individualized experience. Like I'm just gonna use an example. Um, you still get reflections from, of course, the space, the grandioso of the space and the engagement of like, because there's a feeling that you get or that we get as as humans when we enter a space, you automatically, you you have some sort of a mental relationship with that space as soon as you walk mm -hmm. in, right? You're like, oh, it might be too hot, cold, big, whatever. Um, this is awesome. I hate this, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. But, you know, there, the, there were these fantastic companies that were coming up with these really great ways to be able to showcase these different um, artists, uh, but some of them going into the spaces were more individualized. You know, like I, I went in and um, I had the uh, the opportunity to meet Rafik Anadol and uh, go and experience his piece, Machine uh, Hallucinations in New York City. And it was really cool to walk into the space and see everything. But in a lot of ways, it was really to be interpreted by yourself. Mm -hmm. more of it and you could easily go in there and experience like I experienced it myself and I still felt when I walked out of there that I probably could have easily actually engaged in that content in that experience in a virtual sense or in a virtual form because I'm still getting the message that the artist is portraying and trying to put across because I could interpret it myself not to say that it wasn't great to be able to see you know and engage and see what other people's reactions were to it because everybody you know, engages with these experiences on a different level. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, being there and experiencing it myself, I guess the question really comes down to, do you think that it would be possible to take some of those engagements and virtualize them and still have the same effect? Um, I think a, a similar effect, but I think that, that ultimately, you know, the artist would want to have some final um, control over how it's translated. And obviously they would, but I think that 
that it's not so much a direct translation, but a lot of these immersive spaces, I mean, they're kind of in, in 360 environments anyway. Um, and, you know, there have, have been artists that have translated those experiences to virtual reality. So I think that they, it would be a different but similar kind of situation. You know what I mean? So, so I think that it's definitely possible 100%. And I think that you would get a lot of the similarities from it. And I think actually, um, not necessarily a VR, but I think our tech house has actually um, the past couple of weeks been releasing um, sections of their experiences that you can experience online in different ways and interact with. And so it's definitely something that, as I was saying, different but similar, you can experience and you are missing certain things from not going to the live venue in short. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was really well navigated. <laughs> <laughs> so coming from like your own work what are you currently working on like what are you currently exploring and looking into you know during this time that we have and maybe what are some of the uh insights that you might have for the people watching um yeah. uh let's see i think i have my if you want to screen share oh yeah so yeah, here's um so during this time, I've been mostly experimenting, as we mentioned, doing, um, you know, experimenting with doing some 360 and VR stuff and finding ways that uh, I can interpret the work that I do without too much compromising um, and create something that I'm really excited to actually share in 360 or VR. And along with that, I've also been diving into um, some, uh, doing a lot of shaders and GLSL and, and exploring that route because um, with the shaders, it actually, I've worked on it here and there in between projects. And it's really one of those things that having a large chunk of time to dive more deeply into is absolutely necessary, I feel. So, because uh, it's like learning a foreign language a lot, not just with the <laughs> programming aspect, but because there are so many different areas. I mean, there's like, you know, the vertex shader, the geometry shader, which nobody uses, but I'm still yep. learning that anyway. Um, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been playing with a, a little app called Code Life mm -hmm. um, and um, kind of dabbling around on the side with some just tinkering around with some uh, GLSL shaders. And yeah, it can get pretty pretty heavy pretty quick. Yeah, but I love it. I mean, it, it's definitely what I enjoy doing. As you know, I love coding and I love uh, using code to build these really crazy pr um, procedural uh, generative things. And uh, with the two, actually the, the whole top row there, um, I've been mixing a lot of different things. So I'm kind of combining doing the shaders along with um, doing the modular sim stuff that we were talking about the other night. So um, with the ones on the top, I actually, I created the visuals first. I do a lot of real time audio visual stuff where the sound in real time is uh, driving the visuals. But with the whole row on top there, um, I created those first and then I went back with the modular sim and then I created uh, the sound for them. So basically I was watching the behaviors and the movements. They're, they're moving videos. I don't know if it's gonna play here. Let's oh yeah, see. they should, yeah. Let's see. I don't know. Oh. The joys of hosting things online and using yeah. software online. Cool. Good. I'm glad it was in a given frames or anything. So um, with these, what I did is basically, um, I do this often when I'm doing audio visual stuff. So I watched the behavior on the screen as I was making the music and basically um, orchestrated the music to coincide with the, the behaviors and how it was moving and kind of like tell a little I guess, story of the movement through through the music and stuff. So the second one, these are metamorphosis one and two because it kind of changes over time. And then the first one is a, I don't know, more like a hardcore gather, very uh, drum heavy. <laughs> so, so that one's totally different than the other two. My brother used to listen to that. And I was like, <laughs> what are you listening to, dude? <laughs> hard, hard stuff. But it was always fun. We always had a lot of fun with it. I listen to a full range of things and it all depends what I'm working on. And a lot of times actually I'll kind of like layer different songs too, because um, having really chaotic things actually helps me focus. So a lot of times like I'll just like pick random stuff. I don't like Venetian snares and something totally different and then have <laughs> layered on top of each other. And then like the combination of that that just makes no sense at all is actually very focusing for me. So, uh, so that's one little trick that I do sometimes. It's all chaos. Uh, yeah, 100%. It's the best working music. Um, Christy said that she believes this season will transition into events, um, online virtual presentation experiences, in addition to live experiences. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I absolutely agree 100% with that. Um, I've been talking to a lot of people in the industry about that. And uh, I think we think that, uh, you know, general consensus says that when life starts to come back to any sort of normalcy, it's going to start uh, as a slow build towards, you know, more intimate based um, or it'll be more intimate based experiences, but smaller in um, group sizes, right? Yeah. So smaller engagements will start um, probably definitely with social distancing, a whole bunch of crazy new security measures. Um, but I think it's going to come around. It's just going to be a slow build. Yeah, so we're not. I'm one hundred percent. Oh, sorry. Can I? Really <laughs> uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> On that note, yeah, I, I totally agree with what Christy's saying. I think that we're definitely going to go in that direction. Um, a lot of the comments that I was making, I think, were more focused on how to have like the optimal experience. But there's definitely 100 percent for you know artists such as myself and a lot of other people. I'm looking at the names in the chat. Um, I know a lot <laughs> of other people in that list are are interested in finding ways of sharing their work online and through virtual experiences. And so, um, and yeah, I wanna, like I want to do that too. Like I've, I've, as I mentioned to you the other night, I've I've always been a huge proponent of that and being involved in you know a number of different digital art festivals and you know, working um, on a lot of different events. I've always been a huge proponent of digital art and helping digital artists and helping kind of get that message out and mm -hmm. um, working on different ways to try and conform and secure content and stuff like that. So I've always been a huge advocate of that. And I'd love to hear actually from um, anybody watching right now, uh, any of the ideas that they might have or stuff that they've been working on, um, stuff that they might want to share. So you, you, that would be that would be really cool. Are we answering questions right now? I can go. To no, the well, I'm actually going to close things up um, okay. just for this part of the segment. We are going to answer. Uh, we're going to stay live. We're going to answer other some of the other questions that were posted earlier on. Um, but uh, I've been trying to keep these up to about 45 minutes just to mm -hmm. kind of hit the main points, the main, main key points. And of course, there's a thousand more things we could talk about. We could probably stay on for the rest of the day, in all honesty, with the questions and the, the <laughs> and the, uh, the the content that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but Ginger, I just wanted to thank you so, so, so much for joining us today and everybody else um, that did kind of tune in for the first segment. Um, next week, I'm going to be having another good friend on, uh, Bart Cressa. Um, he is a master projectionist, um, founder of Bart Cressa Studios. He's done a lot of amazing work and uh, he's actually been building out a virtual studio inside of his house in California. So we're gonna give you guys a special little treat and give you kind of a virtual experience, if you will, uh, of his space next week. So please come back and check that out. It's gonna be really, really cool. Um, there should be some great information there. And yeah, thanks again for joining and stay ahead of the curve. So Ginger, we're gonna stay on and kind of smash back to some of these questions. So Tracy's been popping all kinds of great ones out. Um, let's get back to Sergio's questions about the interactivity and the sensors that you like to use. Yeah, so, um, and I love this question because I have a whole collection depending <laughs> on, on what I'm doing. Um, and actually, uh, when I approach doing projects, um, because before I started doing this uh, publicly, a lot of it was just experimenting on on my own work and, and doing what I love doing just completely on my own. So um, whenever I would do a new project, it was often based on, okay, I wanna get really good at using the sensor and I'd kind of build a project around, you know, figuring out how to work with that sensor and whatnot, because every project I wanna learn something new. So um, I've done work with the Connect. I wouldn't say it's my favorite, um, but I've done work with the Connect. Um, I have, of course, the Mimu gloves I absolutely love. Um, and the reason I love that is every time I have a sensor, I kind of think about like, okay, what are the options of how I can work with the sensor? And, you know, different sensors have different um, variable controls where, yeah. you know, it's, it's you can um, control things based on a, a changing value. Um, other things are like triggers. Other things are um, combined controls. So you can activate like, okay, when I'm pushing this button and doing this, I want to focus on controlling this. And so every sensor has different types of controls. Um, and so, uh, for example, the leap motion, um, the thing that I like about the leap motion is that it is a physical movement. So I'm a really big fan of physical gestures and movement. And so um, I do like the leap motion in that regard, but um, it is also relatively limited in terms of the uh, dimensions that you can move and interact with it. And so that's one of the things then translating that to the gloves is that the gloves have a similar 
uh, three dimensions of, of movement, X, Y, Z, um, in both directions, um, but then combining that with gestures and uh, being able to build different controls based on that. And so the gloves really give a lot of freedom in terms of how you can uh, map the controls and, and what you can interact with. And it's very intuitive too. So with the gloves, um, you know, when I'm working with a, a camera in three dimensional space, I can make a, a gesture. And then, you know, when I'm, I'm moving my hand around, I, move, my hand is the, the camera. camera. Yeah, exactly. And then I can move the virtual camera and it feels very intuitive. And so that's another thing that I look for in sensors is, is what, feels right, what feels intuitive. And especially if I'm taking what I'm doing and then putting that out into the world for other people to have to walk up to this experience and it ideally will make sense right when they walk up to it. And that's a big part of it is this like intuitive control. And so, you know, connect, you'll see people, the first thing they do is they they put their hands up and they try to find themselves and that's yeah. the, the typical connect reaction. And so, you know, this is connect and then this is, is leap motion and they, it's like this calibration that everybody has to do to figure out the controls. And so um, one of the things that I look for and try to embed into the interactive experiences I create is this really obvious intuitive control that they can do right off the bat instead of having this learning curve of, um, uh, yeah, mi.mu is the name of the gloves, Mimu gloves. Mimu. Mimu. And it is Mew. I, I was pronouncing Mew. them incorrectly. It's me Mew. I, I learned the proper <laughs> pronunciation, so that was my bad a couple months ago. Um, let's see what else. I, uh, I, always loved, uh, I always loved playing with the Nintendo Power Gloves when I was a kid. When the Power Glove first came out, I was like, that thing is the bomb. Like, right. that's the future right there in your on your hand. I did not have a Power Glove, but I really wish that I did. Oh, it was so cool. I would have loved that. So um, I, would, I really liked taking things apart when I was a kid. So I wouldn't have taken apart the power glove, but I really liked uh, figuring out how all the, the circuits worked and everything. And so that would have been a great thing for me to have. I super loved, like, I I loved seeing your piece with the glove, with your your interpretation of it, with the Mimiu. Mi, 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 Mimiu. Mimiu glove. Yeah. And um, I was like, oh my God, she's returned the Nintendo Power Glove <laughs> as an interactive tool mm -hmm. for art. That's awesome. Yeah. So, well, I, disclaimer. So um, the glove, I obviously did not make. So if you guys look up, thank you. Uh, she posted the link to it. Thank you. Um, they, I, I think they just said, did a second set that you can get right now. Um, so if you check them out, I'm pretty sure they have some in stock right now. If not, then they'll be back in stock soon. Um, but they also were working on a collaborative uh, music control uh, which I'm gonna put it on my uh, Christmas wish list. Yeah, so that should be really cool. So definitely, definitely check out the stuff that they're doing because they're doing a lot of really cool stuff. So let's see what are some. Tracy, uh, Tracy asked an interesting question. Um, mm -hmm. There's a service called Stageit.com, and Stageit is a uh, basically a virtual concert arena. Uh -huh. And. Um, she was asking about, uh, I'm just scrolling back up here. Are you able to work with stage it? And um, it looks like it's like, I didn't actually really know what it was until just a few minutes ago when I looked it up. And it almost looks like a format that's kind of um, where the artists could work on the platform and perform and also directly engage kind of like we are with a live stream. Sure. So. Yeah, you pulled it up. I'll check Her that question out. was, would you be able to work with a platform, something like that, or maybe equivalent to something like that? It's possible. I just pulled it up. Um, I haven't seen. So what I would do is, yeah, look into it and see. Um, it said something about interactive, which you yeah. know, that, that got me. Um, and something else. So what I would do is I would look into it because I haven't heard of them and see what possibilities they are there are for presenting live work. Um, because for what I do, I, I do feel like a lot of it gets lost in translation. Because if you're only seeing the visuals, but um, not seeing how it's being controlled live and all of that aspect of it, there's definitely something gets lost. Um, you know, maybe they have, I don't know, that I could be in the corner doing something and you could like, ooh, like see the controls and see the readout from the controls so you could see how I'm doing everything. So I would explore different ways of like, I always like showing people the behind the scenes of how everything is being controlled. And then also, of course, being able to focus on the final output of it, which is the visuals that I'm controlling. So okay, I thought that was uh, that was one of the things that um, drew me to actually talking to you a lot more 
um, was when I met you at the Orlando Science Center with my daughter. And I saw that you basically had everything exposed and you engaged in the piece yourself. You don't see that a lot, you know, like I think we've been seeing it a little bit more um, and we've been seeing a lot more influx of creating digital ex or um, I, not digital experiences. They are digital experiences, but more interactive experiences. Mm -hmm. um, you know, interactivity has definitely been a huge hot topic over the course of the last couple of years. And um, I, I always thought that you were kind of on the front line of that, you know, because that was like three, four, four years, at least four or five years ago when I met or yeah, at least five years ago when I met you, because my daughter was like super, super small and I was bringing her into the space. And, you know, I saw that you were a little bit flustered because you had all kinds of stuff going on. <laughs> but I was like, you know, this she's she's got something going here. Like she's got she's got this going. And I always admired the fact that you engaged directly with your work and, you know, you you created the environment and morphed the environment based on the reaction that you had with the people. Thank you. Yeah, it was, I think that was uh, probably conduit, the the, um, the conductive one. Was that the first one that you saw? Um, it may have, no, it was one with a connect. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm usually running around with a million things going on, especially, <laughs> at, especially at the Science Center uh, for mm -hmm. Otronicon. They're, they're always crazy busy, so I'm sure I was definitely flustered. Um, Rob was asking a really good question about um, Touch Designer with NDI and doing the live streaming. So yes, yep. uh, to Rob, Directly, definitely is yeah, something. RT, RTMP. Yeah, um, they've been doing some really great stuff with uh, right now optimizing uh, live streaming and doing things directly out of Touch Designer and uh, making sure that all the live streaming stuff is very intuitive. So I know Rob has also been doing a lot of that as well. Um, it's definitely yeah, something. I know that um, Notch has also is also got the same kind of pipeline. Well, basically any creative tool that's using NDI. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely been something that I've been thinking about. Um, I'm particularly interested with doing live streaming with the 360 so that, um, you know, instead of just streaming, you know, a regular frame that if people want to do interactive and, and go that route with it and not everybody has a VR headset and <laughs> That's true. I, I am totally aware of that, um, which is why I'm kind of, I guess, maybe trying to make it as versatile as possible if I'm going to do a live stream where if you have a VR, you can watch it here. If you just want to watch in 360, you can go that route. Uh, and then if you just have a normal, uh, somebody was asking the other day about a multi, um, multi monitor setup, you know, can you do a stream for people with like three or four monitors, which, you know, yes, let's, let's throw that in the mix. I was actually, uh, speaking to another, a, a company, um, not too long ago about, um, doing the same thing for, for opera and, and bringing like augmented reality into opera and creating individualized experiences with using kind of augmented reality, um, goggles kind of thing or binoculars. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really neat because they were also trying to figure out um, how they would be able to stream different experiences or different media into people's binoculars um, during the performance and during the show. Mm. And the infrastructure that would be required to be able to build something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was a really interesting, you know, a really interesting concept and idea that is could be very much applied today. Definitely. Yeah. That's very interesting. Hmm. So <laughs> it would be awesome to have a performance with a multi-monitor setup. And Nora mentioned she's doing a con thank you. And doing a concert on public access TV with a bunch of other artists, another option to online platforms. It's not interactive, but it does probably I mean getting your work out there in any format at this point is is a plus. Yes. For sure. Yeah. yeah, I would say that it, it would be um, the most important thing I would say is like for people that are working right now and trying to get their stuff out there is to, you know, not stretch themselves and keep themselves, keep you, keep you who you are, mm -hmm. keep your uniqueness and um, make sure that when you do like, I'm a huge proponent of, of brand and brand recognition. And when you're creating your stuff and your art, you are creating and generating your own brand. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's so important to try and, and keep to that and keep engaged and keep focused and keep pushing that forward and making sure that, you know, I agree wholeheartedly that you should get your art out there, but do it in a way that is you. Yeah. Do it in a way Definitely. of just putting it out there for the sake of getting it out there. 
Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, I, I haven't been in a huge rush to just like, oh, it just has to get out there. I mean, I've been posting on Instagram and stuff, but, you know, these are things that are in development because I, I want it to uh, be exactly what I want it to be before I put it out there. So I'm not, uh, you know, talking about like getting a huge rush. It has to be out there tomorrow because I'm more interested in being the best experience that I want it to be. And so, you know, I'm not going to put it out there before it's ready, but it's definitely something that I'm, I love working on right now and it should be out soon. And somebody asked um, if I'm uh, going to be working with some festivals coming up soon. Uh, I can't say too much at the moment, but uh, I am talking to some festivals at the moment. So I will hopefully be announcing some stuff in the next couple of weeks. So there are some things that I'm very excited about that will be coming up soon. So another reason why I haven't been too rushed on, uh, on just cranking stuff out is because there have been some really good opportunities on the horizon that I've also been focusing on in addition to this stuff. So, so that's really good. I've been also mentioning, you know, there's, there's opportunities for everybody right now. You just have to look for it and you have to dig for it. You know, they're, they're there. Um, they're all over the place. There's, you know, one of the main reasons why I put together this whole thing is to also introduce people into different markets mm -hmm. and bring on a, a wide range and diversity of different people to speak to on this show to kind of show people that there are other options and there are, are other avenues that are all cross talk and cross related, you know, like a lot of the stuff that we're talking about um, today from the digital art world really can also heavily pertain into themed entertainment, can also um, be put into just live design and live live entertainment work, um, which is, well, obviously not, not, um, not happening very much right now, but you know, there are a lot of different avenues that can be explored, fixed installation, and some of those markets are still working, projects are still moving forward, even mm -hmm. though we might be stuck now, there are companies that are creating these great big immersive experiences that are under construction and they are pushing forward, you know, and there are still companies looking for good artists, good people and good talent to be able to work. So if people are still, you know, just keep looking, like dig, 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 dig. And mm -hmm. there's stuff out there for everybody. Just yeah. it's gonna be a little bit different. And every yeah, everybody's situation is different. And I think one of the things that's been interesting about what's happening right now is, you know, we are all creative people. And so when we're challenged with something, then we find creative solutions to try and, you know, overcome that or work that into um, our current situation. And so, you know, I guess thinking positively about this is that it has kind of forced a lot of people to think of alternatives and, mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily yeah, a good thing for everybody. So. Like it's given people a huge opportunity to go and explore different technologies and different things that they just didn't, they either didn't have time for, and it's always been on the, you know, I'm going to get around to it list mm -hmm. um, or different technologies and different things that they just never, you know, heard of before or have never been able to even research or take time to look at before. Mm -hmm. And it's just opened a huge opportunity for a lot of even smaller companies, you know, that were kind of behind the scenes and, and creating these amazing tools and these amazing things. And now people can actually realize and recognize those, you know, and, and also recognize and help some of those smaller companies um, that have just been behind the scenes, really. Mm -hmm. which is really kind of, it, it's, it's, it's great. It's actually great to see. So Ginger, I just wanted to thank you again so, so much for, for coming on. Um, I can't thank you enough for your insights and your knowledge and your talent and all the work that you've been creating. I've always been a huge fan. Thank um, you. And um, yeah, just thank you so, so much for coming on today. Well, thank you for, for having me and inviting me to come on and talk about the stuff. And, and to everybody that's watching, I hope that you guys are finding your own ways to stay inspired and, and stay focused on your work. So I know a lot of people on here, I'm familiar with their work. So I know for a fact they're doing great things during all of this. So, <laughs> so that's good. So keep up the work, everybody. Keep up the, keep up the great work. Um, thank you, everybody, once again, for being so supportive and uh, being supportive of our whole entire community. We're in this definitely all together. Um, so stay, stay strong, keep the needle pushing forward and uh, you know, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep up the amazing work. And I personally look very, very forward to seeing a lot of you hopefully again next week. So thanks again, everybody. Thank you.